what I'm about to show you was uh, unimaginable just a few years ago. I want you to watch this miniature slicer section a piece of tissue while simultaneously scanning it and capturing its electron microscopic figure. Now, this is beautiful. It's remarkable. And electron microscopy allows us to see many things, but it's not very good at helping us finding anything. And so with the advent of artificial intelligence, what deemed to be an impossible task has become ordinary. So today, what we can do is that we can grab these images we capture with the electron microscope and feed that image into a deep learning neural network that will disassemble this figure and eventually try to identify what it is. And it predicts that this particular structure is going to be a cell nucleus. So armed with these tools, we can now take thousands of sections and ask AI to find structures that look like this. And as it does that, we can animate all of these sections on top of each other, ask the computer to trace the boundaries of the objects we want to study, and eventually take all that information and reconstruct it three-dimensionally so we can see what's going on inside of the tissues. So as we do this, what emerges is the following. It's a stem cell dividing inside of a tissue around a muscle fiber, which is that pink structure you see in the middle. So all of these boundaries that we ask AI to um, select for us are shown in this image. So this crystalline structure is the cell membrane of the cells dividing. We're going to shake it like a maraca. And then the mitochondria are going to come out. We ask to find structures that look like mitochondria. We can count these mitochondria in orange, see how many there are. Moreover, we can now remove the membrane and look at the DNA, the chromosomes within the cells separating from each other. This is an absolutely remarkable situation where we have gone from the impossible to the ordinary just by the advent of new technologies. The invisible made visible, ready for us to study and understand. Now, of all scientific disciplines, it is my opinion that biology remains perhaps the most mysterious of them all. And it's not very difficult to see why. Whether you're looking at the jungles of the Amazon or you're looking at the corals of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the complexity and the beauty that is encapsulated by these ecosystems is extraordinary. And just thinking about how, how all these things come together and function day by day by day is an absolute mystery, especially for biological-minded people such as myself. So nature is composed of an immense diversity of life forms. You can see things like this tenophore that uses these little articles on the side to refract light. It looks like it's making its own rainbows. You can also see squid embryos living in these capsule hotels in the ocean, developing, trying to you know, come out and populate the oceans. And just as these two organisms are all over um, uh, the oceans around us, there's a myriad more of animals out there, many of which we really don't understand how they do what they do. And so in my laboratory, what we would like to understand is how some animals are capable of restoring body parts upon amputation or damage, and understand why is it that not all animals are capable of this remarkable biological attribute. So in my lab, we use four organisms that are teaching us every day master classes of regeneration. And we're trying to figure out how they do it. I'm going to start with this snail, which is endemic to the um, jungles of Brazil. These animals have eyes that are very similar to our own eyes. They have a retina, they have a lens, they have a, uh, a cornea. And all of this can be amputated, cut off, and watch being regenerated by the animal in approximately 16 to 17 days. You and I cannot do that, obviously, so please don't try this at home, OK? <laughs> all right. The, the other thing I don't want you to try at home is decapitate yourself. <laughs> the French Revolution tried that. It didn't work, OK? And so. These animals can be decapitated. This is a very humble worm that was collected in an abandoned fountain in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, if you decapitate these animals, remarkably, in approximately seven days, they'll grow an entirely new head. Really an astonishing feat of biological powers. Now, there's another worm that inhabits the oceans of the Pacific and essentially the sands of, um, of French Polynesia in Morea. And these animals, as strange as they look, they're very similar to us in one particularly important aspect, which is that the genes that they use to produce their heads during embryogenesis are indistinguishable from the genes that each and every one of us in this room used in the wombs of our respective mothers to give rise to our heads when we were embryos. 
And as adults, you can take these animals and decapitate them, and they'll actually regrow their heads in approximately 17 days. Remarkable things that happen in nature. These are not modified by, by humans. This is what nature does normally. We look at a closer organism. This is a fish that comes from the savannas of Mozambique in Africa. And these animals are vertebrates, just like you and me. And they can lose appendages, like their tail, for example, and they can grow it back also within a very short period of time. So here you see this tail of the killerfish regenerating in approximately 20 days post-amputation. Now, it is remarkable what we have learned from nature in, in the past, uh, but we still have a long ways to go. Now, it's not that we don't really understand biology. We do. We've made really, really remarkable progress in understanding some of the complexities that make life work. It all started with the discovery of the cells all the way back in 1600 by Schwann and others. And now today we know that cells are the elemental unit of all living forms on this planet. We've also learned that all of these life forms have deep kinship. They're closely, very, very deeply, closely related to each other. And that came with the realization of the power of evolution to help us understand how diversity and variability emerges in nature from the work of Darwin all the way back to 1837. And we also have a practical and theoretical understanding of how traits are transmitted from generation to generation through the process of genetics. And this was, of course, the work of Gregor Mendel in the middle of the 19th century. And if we, you fast forward to the middle of the 20th century, another great accomplishment was figuring out the actual structure of the molecule that codifies all the information that's required to produce all this immense diversity that we see in nature. And that's, of course, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. So any student or objective observer uh, looks at all this and they say, OK, great. Biology has accomplished great things in these 200 years that we've been trying to understand life. But I am here to posit that we are about to take a leap into the future of biology that is very likely going to dwarf the efforts of these past 200 years. And that's because of the technologies that are available to us today. And what I mean by this is this, is that for the last 200 years, biologists have been accumulating data quite linearly. And here's an example. This is accumulation of DNA sequences that were obtained from the beginning of the 1980s to the end of the 1990s. And that accumulation of data was linear. And then in 2000, something happened. The accumulation of DNA sequences became exponential. We went from being able to capture just a few thousand nucleotides per, per, per day to millions of nucleotides per year, and millions of users uh, using this uh, particular information. This is really an astonishing step forward. And so how do we use these technologies exponentially to understand complex biological problems? And I'm going to show you an example from my own lab. So in our lab, what we do is that we take these planarians, we know they regenerate, and then we create conditions that allow them to regenerate, uh, that uh, slow down regeneration, or that essentially force them to fail in regeneration. We take these animals and dissociate them into their individual cell cellular components. There's all these cells floating in the soup. And then we'll take each and every one of those cells, and we'll actually sequence all of the genes that are being turned on at different time points under these three different conditions. And we can produce now is these maps of individual cells telling us what they are doing. So each of those dots that you see in these maps at the bottom of the slide represents a single cell. There's 300,000 cells being measured simultaneously. Again, this was impossible just a few years ago. So what can we do with this data? Well, we can now ask, how are certain tissues responding to the problem of regeneration? And so we can look at muscle, we can look at skin, and we can look at the gut of these animals, look at the genetic composition of these cells, and then we can produce these beautiful maps that tell us when in time certain cells turn on or turn off certain genes. And what we extract from this information is something completely novel, which is that we have now found cellular states that occur very transiently during the process of regeneration that are responsible for allowing these animals to be able to regenerate their heads or any other uh, body part. Completely invisible to us had we not had access to these exponential technologies that are available today. So one of the things that uh, is um, um, really fascinating about all this is that even though we have made tremendous advances in this regard, uh, we still have a lot to go. And there is no uh, other time in, um, in history where we have been uh, confronted with these types of technologies. I mentioned artificial intelligence earlier. 
And so this is a methodology that allows us to create all kinds of models very quickly. But the 21st century is awash with completely new technologies. And history has told us that any culture that adopts new technologies are usually led to make new discoveries. So while artificial intelligence is actually helping us catalog and understand some of these processes, there are new technologies afoot. And they'll be here sooner than we think. Quantum computers, for example. Quantum computers will decrease the amount of time that these calculations, these complex calculations, will have to be made in order for us to even produce even more models. And earlier this year, it was reported that finally, we have been able to produce uh, energy from nuclear fusion. So I imagine a future where all of these technologies will become part of our daily activities, and they're going to push us forward to make even greater discoveries. And what do I mean by that? Imagine new ways of thinking. Imagine new ways of reanalyzing what we think we understand. Let me just give you an example. Could it be possible for us as biologists to invent completely new proteins from what we think we understand about biological processes? And while this is theoretical, it actually is happening right now. So what we can do is that we can take a neural network like this and teach it to speak protein. So we feed it a bunch of nucleotide sequences, amino acid sequences, and ask the computer, can you make proteins from this? And then produces a string of proteins. And then we can ask the same network to ask can these proteins fold in a way that's natural and mimic proteins that are out there? And in fact, this is what you see. That's the proteins folding. And as they get darker in color, that means that the structure is beginning to really become more and more stable. And the reality is that while this was theoretical, the laboratory of Tim Baker at the University of Washington in Seattle has actually taken this to, to task, and his colleagues as well. And now we have essentially dozens of these proteins that did not exist before. This is going to be a wellspring of new therapies, a new understanding of how proteins actually work uh, in, 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 the, in, in the wild. Now, never in the history of humankind have we been in a position to much more effectively and meaningfully deploy science than today. And this is not just in biology. This is everywhere in all the sciences. So take, for example, what we accomplished on December 25th of 2021 as a species from the jungles of Guyana, we were able to send a ship into space carrying a telescope to put it in a fixed orbit about a million miles away from the planet and peer into the edge of the cosmos. This is a remarkable accomplishment. And I like the fact it was done on December 25th because that's also the birthday of Isaac Newton. And it was because the use of science by Isaac Newton that he was able to reveal the invisible forces that keep our solar system together visible. And because we understand him so well, we're able to accomplish this. Now, I don't remember a time in history either that we humans seem to be fighting progress so vigorously and on so many fronts than, than today. And so our world right now is also awash with conspiracy theories. Uh, it's also awash with extremism. It's also awash with climate change denial, as well as active vaccine movement and just generalized fear. It is a paradox that these two things are happening simultaneously. And so whether we peer into the vastness of the universe or we peer right under our feet for trying to expand our understanding of the world, our understanding of the universe, I'm going to ask all of you to please support science and the people who do it. Remain curious, because this particular endeavor that we do today is really going to mark how we're going to be able to adopt these technologies into the future. So instead of fearing this technology, Let's embrace it, and let's try to use it in a way that enriches our lives much more than that, that we can possibly imagine. So I will leave you with this thought, that even though you know, I'm working with these very strange animals, trying to understand the problem of regeneration, I think that these technologies will allow us to, and force us to think about biology differently. So I'm going to ask you to please support scientists, because it's very likely that what scientists do today, no matter how esoteric, no matter how impractical it may appear, it may actually make a difference between a dark and a luminous future for all of us. Thank you.